Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Let's Combinate. I'm your host, Subi Sade, and today we are honored by Mike Denzer, who is one of the most well-known people in combination products. I've seen him at a bunch of conferences, and he, he usually has an entourage, but Mike is a renowned mechanical engineer in the combination product space. He's worked a lot on auto injectors. His his background is technical, but he comes off as like the most easygoing, humble guy in the world. And as I was preparing for interviewing him, I found out that he has a bunch of patents and has worked in the R&D and development space, maybe in a more elaborate way than I had anticipated. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for the invitation and for all the kind words. I wanted to talk to you about networking because I've gotten to meet a lot of people in the combination product space, and I'm really surprised by the amount of people that know you and like the way that they come off, like they know you is like, they know you pretty well. How do you do that? As far as networking goes, a lot of times when I talk to people about relationships and networking, they always talk about things like just be normal find out what people are struggling with. And if there's something that you can help them with, help them. Don't overthink exactly. it. We call it networking. For me, it's just as an engineer, right? Actually growing up as an engineer, you dream that you're going to make something great, like a machine or a, a bridge or something like that's going to really like people are going to remember and change history or whatever. And then you go to college, you learn your craft, you start working and realize there's probably more important things in the world than being remembered. Very early in my career, I had a shock, but it was really life-changing. I was walking a technician, through, he was an outside electrician, walking him through the facility at Sharing Plow to show him where the new machine was to do the installation. And what we passed the albuterol lines, we were running thousands of bottles every minute. And he said, you guys make that? My daughter would be dead if she didn't have her albuterol. At that moment, I went cold because I didn't realize the weight and importance of what we were doing. That stayed with me my whole career. I've been lucky enough to run into people at a contract manufacturer, having the operators on the line tell me that not only are they happy to make the product, but they're actually a patient and they wouldn't be able to do the job without the medicine. Those experiences have really shaped what I do and how I perceive our jobs. No one of us can do everything. It really takes a village or a city of people to single-mindedly, hey, how can we get this product to patients in need? I took it on as a personal mission to help in any way I can to bring those people together to help get products to the market. We call it networking, but really I just meet people when they tell me what they do. I'm like, oh, do you know this one? Because they need that help. Or, hey, did you ever talk to Subi? He's very knowledgeable in X, Y, and Z and auditing and quality. And he gave this great presentation. Go talk to, oh, you don't know Subi? Let me introduce you. So to me, it's all about how can we work together to get very valuable needed products to our families. So I appreciate that. At Albuterol specifically, both of my daughters have used it. My second daughter was really struggling with breathing and we'd have to put her on this nebulizer and she'd Albuterol and budesonide. Terrible. And it was just so scary because I'm just like, oh my God, seeing her with the mask on and crying and trying to keep her still. Yeah. I think you realize what you're doing, but it's different when it's somebody that you know or you care about. I got my career started out in IV bags. And every time I go to the hospital and I see an IV bag, I'm just like, my God, what a marvel, even though it's just a bag of water. It's All the things so that amazing. go into making that. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, now, as far as network goes, one thing that I hear often is activate your network. And like, what does that mean to you? Because you mentioned, let me introduce this person to that person, et cetera. But as you've built your Rolodex, your network, you, you don't want to always be a taker. So how do you manage that? 
I don't see it as a game as much as it's just like you see a need and you just try to fill it. I think as kind of engineers and scientists, that's really what we try to do. I just happen to enjoy when I hear about a need, I think about who do I know that can help? It doesn't have to be about a job. It doesn't have to be about making money. It doesn't have to be about contracts or anything like that. And everybody that I've met along the way wants to help however they can. And now we have industry forums and things like that, but just connecting two people, maybe working at different companies that maybe they're working on something similar or they have a question, somebody has a question, I know who can answer that. It's really valuable, right? Because that means that someone can now move on, they get the answer or they get the perspective they need. Now they can go move on and get that product to the market or push it to the next step. Yeah. And I, I think what you're saying about it not being a game is totally fair. And I'm fully aligned with the attitude of just give freely and try to help people as much as possible. At the same time, whether it's on pharma or med tech, engineers by and large fall into the introvert category. You have a few of us, I would say like maybe me and you who are like, this maybe comes naturally to us, whatever. No. It doesn't, I'm not saying it's not uncomfortable. It's always uncomfortable walking and talking to somebody that you don't know. But like at, at the same time, you can't sit there and tell me like Mike Denzer is actually working against and beating all the odds against what he's naturally skilled at to be like, come on. But I guess where I'm getting at is some people really struggle with networking. And so for those people, what are some practical things that can help them? Because trying to figure out how to help people, you, you have to know people. You have to yeah. know what they're struggling with, be able to talk to them, et cetera. But put yourself in the place of an introvert person who is early on in their career and they want perspective. They want to meet more people, to help more people, but they don't know where to start. Yeah. I got to say that for most of my career, I was very much like the last person who would want to talk at a meeting or ask a question or make a comment. And it took me a while to realize. And finally I did start to ask questions in meetings. And I realized like people would come to me after the meeting and go, it's really good that you asked that question. I had the same question. I didn't even know what they were talking about. I'm like, it may be a stupid question, but I don't know the answer. They're using some acronym or talking about some new subject. I should at least ask the worst that can, they can say is it's just Denzer talking too much, but it, that's been a really good approach for me is just, it's not that I'm asking a million questions in every meeting. It's just be thoughtful about the question, but do ask questions that yeah. will lead to a lot of insight, but a lot of open doors and people will become like more comfortable with you and say, Hey, that was a really good question. I just asked the question. No. And it cuts both ways, to be honest, because there's a genuineness that comes to asking, even if it's a basic question, like even if everybody in the room knows, if you don't know, and you're comfortable asking a question, the perception is that this person doesn't just go with the flow, even if it's something that makes them look like a fool. There's a difference between looking like a fool and actually being one. The fool is the one who sits in a room full of people who know something and is hanging on to the fact that they don't know the thing, but they're not willing to ask. Like, yeah. that's like the definition of being a fool. But I think what you also said around, like for me, podcasting and talking to so many people in different stages of their career, like there's a guy who I really like. He had a talk and he put it on LinkedIn and the talk was about tariffs but it was called nobody knows anything. The reality is it's on a scale. Some people know more than others, but by and large, we all know a lot less than what could be known. Yeah. And just taking that approach of, Hey, everybody here has some level of, they don't know everything and giving yourself a little bit of just reducing the barrier to talking. I think is super helpful. Absolutely. Now, um, I, I want to move into some of the technical stuff that you worked on because you've spent a lot of your career in the auto injector space in particular. 
Where do you see, because I feel like when it comes to injectors in particular, there was this wave of innovation that went from single use more towards multi-dose, more towards a multi-dose with a GUI. And then now it's like getting back to what's the minimum we need to deliver the product. Then it could be a platform. It could be a modified platform. It could be fully new platform, but people have added a level of practicality that's based on experience where they're like, I'm not going to have a drug collecting dust on the shelf so that I can have the spaceship of auto injectors to help deliver it when delivery is the main thing, delivery and safety. Well, I've seen in my career, which I started in the 1990s, everybody was building their own devices. They weren't called combination products back then. And then they started to call a medical device and that didn't fit quite right, but but anyway, everybody was designing their own and the name of the game was differentiation. Mm -hmm. They wanted their product to be different. Thus, they had a different device. Moving in to later times when biologics became more popular, the name of the game changed to how fast can I get my molecule to the market? What the molecule is the differentiator not the device. When companies like Amgen were successful with their auto injector, had a good track record, the industry felt comfortable moving into auto injectors as a whole. And so they became ubiquitous. Specifically, there's two or three main companies that everybody knows and everybody flocks to them because they feel comfortable with those. Then we started to think about how can we have connected devices and what can we add to devices to make them more digital under the guise of user-friendly. And I think that's had some application, but it's been limited to a few use cases. And now as the industry is struggling with having to deliver larger volumes of liquid with higher viscosities. There's just a limit to how much of the molecules you can squeeze into a certain volume. So now we're looking at how can we deliver larger volumes that are more viscous than water, harder to extrude. For a while, we were looking at on-body injectors and then more recently, some innovation in auto injectors. For large volume? There's concepts out there, some development activity going on. Ipsomed has a 5.5 milliliter injector, which sounds interesting, but I haven't seen it fully adopted yet. It's interesting to see how these developments go in cycles. Ultimately, the patient needs to have something simple to use and fit for the application. I do think that these kinds of problems are known, like technical issues, delivering high volumes or delivering viscous products. Um, there are technical challenges there. I also think that there are a lot of issues that don't get talked about at all, like supply of basic products, like configurations of kitted devices that go into vial kits where kitting operations happen off the shelf, finished medical devices are not set up for that. While some of the technical issues are real issues. There's a lot of other, basically what I'm getting at is a lot of people will focus on the issues that are cutting edge, say issues like how do we deliver something that's five to 10 ml that's super viscous, a total problem. But there is also like an issue of, hey, every component that you try to order that's off the shelf has a six to eight month lead time. Yeah. For basic component, as basic as it gets for a perineural product. What's the lead time on a syringe? Yeah, forever. Last thing I wanted to talk to you about, Mike, is you've worked your way through a few different, um, a little bit. and so you've seen the generic space, you've seen biologics, you've seen the innovative pharma space versus the generic space, and then you moved into consulting. Um, you worked at the Civica RX, which is a nonprofit that helps deliver products that maybe don't have the same value. Financial for. value, the, right? Yeah, like value prop as other products where... They're off patent, but nobody wants to make them because there isn't really. And so you've seen, I think, a little bit more, you have maybe more industry wisdom just beyond somebody who's worked at only a sponsor. 
Related to networking, what are your thoughts on collaboration? Time you go to a conference, hey, we can help you with this and we can help you with that. Sometimes you work with other companies and they end up doing more harm than good because you're bringing them up to speed on all of your problems and then they don't actually understand the industry they're working in or they have their own baggage of, I've seen this exact problem before and it's not the exact problem. They give you a hundred documents that are unrelated and they end up slowing you down. Absolutely. So talk about versus looking at networking of the entire ecosystem. Yeah. So the example you brought about the consultants is really important and it's important to check their advice against your network. Right. The real sticky problems are usually industry problems, not just problems for your company. You know, your counterpart at a different company, like, of course, you don't want to talk about anything proprietary, but you can talk in general terms about a regulatory pathway that's questionable or an approach to validation or approach to development and just share knowledge with your network, guidance from your network. One example that I had recently at Civica, we were developing interchangeable biosimilar insulin. And the whole interchangeability is a regulatory pathway that's not very well understood. I had gotten some advice from a very high level human factors expert, former FDA, but understanding that this was an interchangeable biosimilar, that advice just didn't sit well with me. It just didn't make sense. So I went to the network and kept asking questions of people in the industry. I was able to formulate a much more efficient and sensical program, hopefully saving Civica millions of dollars and a lot of time. And as far as when to bring external help versus building internal capability. Most small companies are really good about developing the molecule, getting into clinic. And then around phase two, they start to make the decisions about what do they want to bring to phase three in the final product. That's where a lot of small companies start to need outside expertise. And typically they'll lean on their CMO for that expertise, but there's not a that expertise doesn't necessarily lie at the CMOs. And then all through the combination product development aspects, there's still a lot of confusion in the industry about, is this a medical device or a combination product? Besides some of the people that work with this stuff every day, a lot of the industry still doesn't understand it. Small companies should seek out experienced help very early before they pick a CMO before they pick their primary packaging, before they make the wrong decisions that could limit them from making the right decisions later. Say they want to go into an auto injector, but they've picked the wrong syringe, right? Small companies need to reach out much earlier than medium and large companies. Last, last question is what is the best device you've ever worked on? Best device I ever worked on, I can say one of the most interesting devices that I've worked on was the Amgen's AutoClick. It was meant as a reusable device that could accommodate a number of different drugs in the Amgen pipeline and portfolio. It was meant to overcome issues with different fill levels, different viscosities, and different injection speeds. That was a fantastic project to work on. And I've seen Amgen finally got that approved and several companies developing similar injectors since. That was one of my favorites. And then of course, I've worked on several inhalers and things that are really, people really need those products. I counted five patents you're on for that auto injector. So that's super cool. Where can people find you, Mike? Subi, you can find me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Mike.